Hello, everybody. My name is Rob Daumler. I'm a principal at Daumler & Associates. I want to welcome you to our presentation today on mastering your retirement in any market condition. You know, I've been in this business for 27 years as a certified financial planner, um, and it's incredible at times like this when we have a lot of concern and uncertainty. Uh, it's really where we or where I really enjoy what I do. Um, we focus on full holistic financial planning. The reason I love what I do is I get to know a lot of different people and I know their whole family situation. Um, I get, get to know them as friends and the more I understand them, uh, the better planning I can do for them. So there's a lot of different people that have worked with us for many years, uh, own different businesses, have been professionals for a long time, and they've grown to trust us in handling their financial situation. And really, it's not just about the investments. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about investment planning and investment emotional investing. Uh, but it's really about bringing peace of mind to their financial situation. That's our goal is I want my clients to be able to walk away and know that all their financial fares are well looked after. So the biggest thing is the media is focused on probably a lot of the wrong things that we shouldn't be paying as much attention to. If we're looking at investments and markets and on a daily basis, these are things that we can't control. And so if we're going to spend all our time just looking at current market conditions, first of all, nobody knows what's going to to happen tomorrow um, and so we need to focus on the long-term financial plan uh, we need to stay the course through these difficult times is you know too often you may know a lot of people that are reacting emotionally and anytime we react emotionally usually it's uh, something we regret later on and so we need to have strategies that are going to help us navigate through these difficult times and so i'm going to talk a little bit about not just ig's approach but our approach as a financial planning team you're going to hear from myself Again, with 27 years experience as a certified financial planner uh, from my associate partner, Lucas Mertz, who's also a certified financial planner and has been in the business for seven years. And at the end, you're going to hear from uh, Jamie Bucken, who's been in the business for over 30 years. Uh, he's been an advisor. He's a business planner. He works with a lot of other advisors. And one of the biggest compliments is you know, that he works with us personally uh, because he believes in what we do. So these are some of the things that we're going to cover today. Um, and so right now, market volatility is kind of the talk of the day. Uh, the biggest piece is the only constant is change. Um, every time there's a market correction, there's a different reason for it. So I've heard many times in the last couple of months, people are saying, well, this time is different. And they're absolutely right. This uh, virus that we're going through right now, we have to go back 100 years to see a similar time frame when you look at the Spanish flu. Um, but what happens is every time there's a market correction. There's a different reason that caused it, but the market doesn't react differently. Okay, the reason this one was so significant is typically a market's going to go down about six months before a recession. This recession was immediate. We went from, from a very strong economy and overnight that economy was shut down. So the recession was immediate. And so this drop in the market happened in 22 days. We had a correction, which typically takes about eight weeks. So it was very unusual in its depth. But again, the market reaction and the market performance is not that unusual. We had a, a peak to trough drop of about 35%, which is not unusual when you have a significant market event or economic event like we did. This slide here, you can see I've circled back in 2009. This is when tax-free savings accounts came out. And I'll never forget is that we had the financial crisis of 2008. The markets were actually down 40, 45% at that point in time. And everybody had this new investment option in Canada to invest into. At that point, we could put $5,000 into a tax-free savings account. And so many people wanted to put that money into money market funds because they were so scared of the market. The market was continuing to go down. And again, everybody was saying this time is different, but it wasn't. Ultimately, the, the economy re returned to normal uh, and we had growth ever since. But everybody that put money into money market funds was getting 0% rate of return. I mean, Zero. Inflation was higher than that. People were guaranteed to lose out by putting the money into money market funds. But if you invested in a equity investment at that time, you'll see on the next slide here is that the significant rates of return that happened on the market over the next uh, 20 years. Next slide, please. You can see the S&P 500 since the end of December, so not quite the market bottom because the market bottom happened in March of 2009. But even from December 31st of 2008 till December 31st of this past year, the S&P 500 representing the 500 biggest companies in the United States 
did 15.3%. Globally, all the numbers were very good. Canada and Europe were just under 10%, and the world indexes were around 12. So if you took the average, if you invested all your money in the equity markets, you would have averaged over 11.5%. The problem is, is nobody actually did this, is because we were so fearful of what happened before, we're constantly waiting for the next shoe to drop. And so you can see there's always another reason. This slide is great because, again, the media is a big part of this. As you can see, you know, back the Acropolis now, that was when the pig nations of, of Europe, so Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, they were going broke. And so you had this big concern over the European Union collapsing, which is one of the biggest markets in the world. And everybody was fearful. The markets went down for a period of time. Then it moved on to the over the cliff, which is the fifth fiscal cliff that happened in the United States because of the problems with their government, which we see every year continuing today and the great divisions they have in there between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is there was no agreement on continuing to pay their debt. And so people were fearful that the U.S. government was going to uh, stop paying their debt on January 1st of the following year because they didn't have any agreement politically. And they created this term called the fiscal cliff. It never existed before and hasn't even heard of this since. But again, the media jumps all over this with the fiscal cliff. And then we're talking about the next great recession. And we're talking about anarchy in the UK, which is Brexit. Then we've got the great American downgrade. And through all of this, even though you've got all these different reasons that the markets go, go down, the market continued to go up. Short term, we're on a roller coaster. There's ups and downs of the market. So this is what I was talking about before, is that this slide is showing you where everybody's been putting their money over the last 20 years since, well, I guess, sorry, 12 years since the 2008 financial crisis. The blue bars above the line is the money that's going into fixed income investments. So those are government bonds, mortgages, guaranteed investments. And you can see that $1.6 trillion has gone into these guaranteed investments and $1.4 trillion has actually come out of equity investments. So while the market's gone up somewhere on average of over 11%, people have been putting more money into fixed income investments at the lowest interest rates in history, okay? So emotionally, because we're so scared of what happened in 2008, we've been sitting in these fixed income investments, and so our portfolios haven't done nearly as well as if they'd been invested in the equity investments. So again, any kind of financial plan should have a balanced portfolio in there, depending on the risk profile of the client. But you can see here is people have been getting very fearful, and it's making them emotional, and they're making the wrong decision. And that's what's clearly shown in this chart over the last 12 years. Next slide. So now the question is, how bad is it going to get from here? I said earlier that this was the fastest correction in history. There was a 20% drop in 22 days. I'm very proud that our company was able to uh, actually lead the industry in March when it came to net contributions to portfolios is we actually had net positive contributions all the way through March. We see these drops as a significant opportunity. And in April, it was the best month on the market since the early 1970s. And so, yes, we had a very quick correction, but there was nothing we could do about it. But we had a significant rebound in April and all our clients stayed on board. And by staying invested, they had significant returns in their portfolio. So despite all this negative news, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, that that negative news is actually getting a little better, the markets have been recovering. Because again, like I said earlier, typically the markets will predate what's happening in the economy by about six months. It was very unusual here because we literally went into a recession overnight. But typically the market today is pricing what they think is going to happen early next year. Now the biggest piece is... Anyone that sits here, if you are going on any kind of presentation where somebody is telling you where they think the market's going to go, run. Run as fast as you can because ultimately they don't know. We've seen many situations where people predict. Um, there's a company uh, run by a guy by the name of Mitch Anthony who does a lot of retirement planning. And he uh, showed, they actually followed all the leading economists of the leading investment companies in America. And over a period of three years, they tracked all their predictions. And these leading economists... Some of the smartest guys you're ever going to know were correct 47% of the time. You'd have been better off flipping a coin than actually listening to these so-called experts. Nobody knows where the market's going to go. And the markets always recover. They go up and to the right. And that's what this chart shows. This is a longer-term view. It's really looking at a 60-year period from the late 50s into 2020. And you can see all the little red circles. There's all these big drops. There's always something new that's going to make the market go down 
but you still had an 8.93% annualized rate of return. So again, the negatives are always going to be there. And if I know, if I can look in the future and look back, Anytime I'm in a situation where the markets drop 20, 25, 40 percent, I've got to look at that as an opportunity. Depending on where I am in my life, don't run, run scared. It's like Warren Buffett said, be greedy when people are fearful and be fearful when people are greedy. When the markets are way up and people are getting greedy, you need to be careful. But at times like this, the smart money is being invested in good quality companies that are unfairly being punished today, even though they're actually finding great opportunity because everybody's adjusting to the new reality of the current economy. Next slide. This is why we invest for the long haul, is this is a typical bell curve. And what I'm showing here, and I've highlighted a few of the years here. On the left, I've circled uh, what ha happened in 2008. And you can see on the bottom is the rates of return on the market for that calendar year. And in 2008, the market was down between 30 and 40 percent. My point being is that if you looked at that as a great, great opportunity invested in the market in 2009, which I have highlighted on the right with that bar, is that you had a 20 to 30 percent rebound. 2010, another 10 to 20 percent. And in 2011, another zero to 10 percent. So if you looked at the end of 2008 and you invested in the market, the next three years would have been fantastic rates of return. So again, when you're making investment decisions, don't worry what's going to happen in the next two weeks or the next four weeks. I have lots of clients that ask me, hey, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I have no idea. But ultimately, if I can look three years, four years down the road and look back, I know this is going to be a great opportunity for us to invest. 74% of the time the markets go up and only 26% of the time they go down. That's why investing in the market works for us. Next slide, please. So what we do is largely determined uh, by our emotions. And, and so when we see these significant drops, what this chart is showing you here and all these red uh, little circles um, are showing you the intra-year drop. So you can see in literally every year since 1980, there is a significant drop on the market. There's a few years that are insignificant, but most years you're having somewhere around a 10 to 20 percent kind of drop in the market. I've circled two here, 1987 and in 2009. In 1987, if you remember the stock market crash that happened over mainly one day, Black Monday, but it happened over a couple of days, you had a significant 30 percent drop in two days. OK, however, if you invested January 1st of 1987 and you came back January 1st of 1988, you'll have made 2% positive rates to return. So again, what did you do after those two days in October? You got to look at that as an opportunity. And in 2009, it's no different. So the market went significantly down in the financial crisis late in 2008, but it continued to go down in early 2009. So again, it was down 30%. But if you stayed invested January 1st of 2009, and came back January 1st of 2010, your rate of return would have been 23%. So again, when we were sitting there in March of 2009, I had to twist people's arms to say, no, don't buy the money market fund. You need to buy an equity investment. This is a golden opportunity. And that's what's happened most recently is with the market drop, we've had another golden opportunity to invest and make significant rates of return. Now, the biggest problem is when we emotionally invest and we pull ourselves out of the market when the markets are down, we can never recover. That's what this chart is showing here, is if you stay fully invested from 1999 to 2018, your rate of return was just under 6%. If you miss the 10 best days over that 20-year period, okay, 10 days in 20, that's one day every two years. If you missed that best day, your rate of return was cut down less than half, all right? Now, this market correction that happened in 2020 with the COVID crisis is a prime example. You had days in the market where they were going down 10%, but you had days where they were going up 10%. You cannot time that. Nobody can time that. And you can get crushed if you're trying to invest and you're letting your emotions take hold. So the key is the only way to success is to stay invested and stay in the market. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you a couple of different charts here, and this is what's uh, uh, happening in, in the COVID crisis here. And so you can see back in March, they shut down the economy in the middle of March, and consumer spending just dropped like a rock and went all the way down to a drop of nearly 37%. Okay, But what's happened since, and the market is reacting to this, is that consumer spending is recovering. Initially, a lot of people were in shock. This was very new. 
Um, it was incredible the number of conversations I had back then as we were talking to different clients. But you can see that the economy is starting to rebound as people are starting to spend in the new world. They might be doing this online, but we'll talk about that in one of the future slides. But things are recovering, and that's why the market and the increase in the market is actually supported. Next slide, please. Consumers are spending on home improvement. So this is a very interesting thing that's happened here. Is if you look at that dark bar, that's really apparel, gifts, jewelry. Those are really the the extras where you know I, I can picture going out in a nice suit or or if someone's buying a nice new uh, necklace or whatever um, or buying gifts. These are the kinds of things that have kind of dropped. They are recovering. You can see that bottom line is starting to come back up. But what's happened is how people are spending a lot of money on household improvements. If you've walked into any Canadian Tire or Home Depot in the most recent uh, few weeks, you can see that they're busier than they've ever been. It's incredible how many people, we're going to have the nicest gardens in the world this year because everybody's at home doing all that extra work on their house instead of being out spending money on clothing and dining, which we'll see in the next slide. So this is the difference between growth grocery shopping and dining and you can see that really it was a kind of even there's a little bit increase in dining and groceries and then obviously dining fell through the floor because we weren't allowed to go to uh, restaurants anymore and then grocery spending went way up and so this was where we were lining up and we're wearing our masks and we're going to the grocery stores and I know where I live the Safeway was busier than it ever had been and so everybody was spending a bunch of money on groceries now I'm going to make an argument it wasn't just on toilet paper it was on other things as well uh, but we've seen that bounce back as grocery spending went significantly down and it's still increased for the year. Um, but we're starting to see a rebound in, in dining. But that dining rebound is going to come as the economy continues to open and restaurants start to open. They're only opening at 50 percent capacity, but that's going to improve. And more and more people are getting comfortable with getting out and going to restaurants again. But you can see that there's the reaction uh, to the uh, what happened with the lockdown. So what can we do to protect our next nest egg? The most important thing, and we're going to get into some of these details next, is we need to have a plan and stick to it. We don't know what the markets are going to do. If you do not have a written financial plan, it's going to be very difficult not to react emotionally in these, these very uh, strange times. And like I say, it's always a different reason that the market go down, but it's a... Uh, um, it's important that we stick to our plan and ignore the markets. We need to have proper diversification. In Calgary, that's very difficult. A lot of people work in the oil patch. In the past, a lot of people had all their money in the oil patch. Uh, that's changed. We need to have money diversified all over the world in different asset classes, not just equities, but some fixed income, government bonds, as well as U.S. and international and emerging market equities. We need to invest for the long term. That's how we become successful. If we try and time the market, there's just too many things that can go wrong. And emotionally, it's just very hard to do. Then we need to come up with a retirement income strategy. This is the thing that actually makes the big, biggest difference to the success of people's financial plans. Lucas is going to talk in a little bit about the percentages of success in people's financial plans. This one has one of the biggest impacts is make sure that we take out our retirement income in the best way possible to minimize taxation and to properly diversify our investments. And the next piece is professional advice. When things are going well, nobody feels like they need professional advice. If I'm healthy, I don't go see my doctor. But when I become unhealthy, then all of a sudden I'm relying on my doctor. And I'm looking at the financial services almost the same way as when things are going really well, you can pretty well throw a dartboard at, a, at a, an investment chart and pick any investment you're going to do okay. It's times like this when the markets go down that you need professional advice. I argue that you need it all, all the time because – that professional advisor that you trust needs to be there through all thick and thin because we never know when difficult times are going to come, not just with respect to the markets, but things with uh, sickness and health and in uh, estate planning, all those things that can derail a financial plan. It's really important to have that professional advice. Next slide, please. So what does peace of mind look like in retirement? Well, one of the things that's happened is, is Canadians are living longer. And if you're a couple that is approaching 60 years of age, there's a 50% chance one of you will live beyond 90. So the biggest piece is when we're making investment decisions and we might be retiring in the next couple of years, people get extremely conservative. And that's not necessarily the answer because over the long haul, you still need to keep up with inflation. You could be retired for 30 years for almost as long as you worked. Okay, so it's very important that we understand that there's a good likelihood that our retirement plan is going to be long. And so we got to make sure that we have a plan that's going to keep up with 
inflation, uh, manage all the taxation, and uh, we're going to get into a few other uh, slides here to talk about some other concerns as we age. So this is something that's very important and why you know financial planning becomes even more important once we're retired. Uh, the industry does uh, surveys of clients and it's really testing uh, financial literacy. And if we test a, a bunch of people between the ages of 60 and 94, and we give them some fairly straightforward financial questions. It's a, a 16 question quiz. And on average, between the ages of 60 and 94, they get 58% of the questions right. But the mean score for people over 80 is only 18%. Okay, so as we age, the unfortunate reality is we have a little bit less knowledge when it comes to financial capacity. That's just natural. As, as time goes and financial literacy becomes more difficult and there's more different types of products and stuff, it's difficult as we age to stay on top of that. So again, with financial planning for retirement, I like to break it down into really three stages. When we're younger and healthier, we're doing more, we call that your go-go years. When we're in, uh, say, around 75, we call that our slow-go years. We might spend time closer to home with our family. And then as we get older, unfortunately, we call that your no-go years, where we might be more in a retirement home, staying really close to home and spending a lot less. And so your financial plan needs to adjust all of that. So the biggest problem is, as financial literacy goes down, our confidence goes up. And we actually think we're smarter than we are. And so the biggest piece is we've got to make sure we're doing sound financial planning in our 50s and 60s, and we have a sound, trusted financial advisor or family member that's helping us through all of this because they need to be there when we're older. I can talk about story after story of clients I've had for 27 years that when they were 60, things were great, but now in their mid-80s that things are having, we're having some difficulty because of, of just decreased capacity. So it's very important that we have sound financial planning and a trusted advisor. Next slide, please. This is the impact of inflation over the long haul. Now, inflation is very low today, but this shouldn't surprise anybody. I know when I was a kid, you know, I only needed a dime or, or 25 cents to go get a bag of chips. Um, and it was hard to find that dime or that quarter. Well, today you can find that in your, you know, your change drawer in the middle of your car. You'll have dollars of change and stuff like that. So. You know, things cost a lot more today than they did a long time ago. And so if you're going to be retired for 30 years, we've got to be prepared for the increases in costs. A lot of that could be medical as well, as we continue to have more needs down the road for medical uh, support. So that, again, is something that's really important that your financial plan deals with that. Another piece that can impact our long-term uh, plan, and this is something that Lucas is going to focus on as we move forward from here, but... If we get into retirement and we have poor early performance, it can really adjust our long-term plan and impact the success of that plan. And so we need to make sure that typically with my clients, I like to have one year of money that's kind of set aside, that's in a safe place, that if the markets have a, a difficult year, we can leave the money invested and let it recover, and we can use some of the more conservative money. And so you got to be prepared. It's not that uh, this situation is unusual. It happens too regularly, so we've got to make sure our financial plan is prepared to weather the storm through these market corrections. And so with a lot of clients, what we've done is we've adjusted in, in the, the three-month period while the market went down and now is recovering, we've adjusted where we're getting their retirement income from, and then we'll, we'll kick it back in once the markets have recovered, which we've seen. So right now, I want to pass it off to uh, Lucas. I want to thank you for your time, and Lucas is going to talk a little bit more about financial planning. Thanks, Rob. So that was some great information on previous market activity and really how to manage uh, your portfolio through these volatile times. So I'm going to switch gears here and talk about financial planning as well as portfolio management and really how to merge those two disciplines together. And specifically what I'm going to be talking about is sequence of return risk. Uh, it's something that not pe not many people pay attention to, uh, but it can be really impactful on how you create a retirement plan and also how you manage your portfolio. Um, so I'm going to take you through an example here. Uh, if we had a $100,000 portfolio uh, given a 5% average rate of return, and we're going to use this capital to live off of in retirement. So we're going to be taking $600 a month from this portfolio. Uh, we would want to know how long does this money last? Um, and given that flat rate of return, our money would be depleted by age 89. 
Uh, so this is something that Rob and I see often is a asset projection rather than a retirement plan. And there can be some pitfalls to using a static rate of return um, because I'm sure all of us, we haven't looked over our statements the past 10 years and seen the exact same rate of return each year. No, we know that equity markets move up and down some years a lot, some years less. Um, so the way to project that would be to use a sequence of returns. So I'm going to run this scenario again, only now I'm going to use different rates of return each year. And we're going to keep it simple, so we'll just use three rates of return and we'll keep cycling through. So in the first year, we're going to get a 5% rate of return. In the second year, we get a negative 15% rate of return. And in the third year, we get a 25% rate of return. And then we'll just keep going clockwise and get those same rates of return all the way through retirement. You'll notice that we haven't changed your average rate of return. If you take those three numbers, add them up, divide by three, we still get a 5% average rate of return. And we're running the same example where we have a $100,000 portfolio and taking out that $600 a month. Only now, once we, do, once we introduce volatility to the portfolio, our capital is depleted by age 83. So we've lost six years of retirement income by introducing volatility to this scenario. And I'm not using specific numbers or a specific sequence to make it seem like this or manipulate the numbers. Um, and to prove that, I'll just run it in reverse. So in the first year, we get a 5% rate of return. In the second year, we get a 25% rate of return. And in the third year, we get a 15% rate of return. And we're just gonna run this sequence in a counterclockwise order. Now, given the same constraints, we have 100,000, same withdrawal rate. Um, our capital is depleted by age 87. So we've still lost two years of retirement income by introducing that volatility to the portfolio. And that's what sequence of return risk is. We cannot accurately predict what return we get in the next year. So the problem becomes, how do we fix that sequence of return risk? And really what you do is through proper portfolio management, and you can test all of the recommendations and changes that you make in a portfolio with a Monte Carlo analysis. So I'll explain what a Monte Carlo analysis is. Um, what you do is a Monte Carlo analysis takes a lot of information and a lot of inputs uh, to spit out a result. So instead of just putting a static rate of return, what we do is we plug in an individual's portfolio down to the specific asset allocation. We would know the fixed income and equity, and we would also know the volatility of the portfolio. And the way we know that is through standard de deviation. And what standard deviation is, is it's just a range of returns that the portfolio is expected to get. So the hypothetical range that are most likely to happen. So what a Monte Carlo analysis does is it will pick random rates of return within that range each year of retirement. So we can see from age 65 all the way onwards, we're gonna be picking a random rate of return in that range each year. And then we're gonna run retirement over 600 times. And when we do that, what we get is a scenario that looks like this. Now from that scenario, you will get a passing grade. You will get how many times out of that 600 would I be successful in reaching my financial goals? And you can see there's a wide array of different outcomes that could happen. Some years we run out of money quite early, and in other times we have a large estate to hand down to the next generation. Um, but really, when it comes to a Monte Carlo analysis, if you make changes in your portfolio, you can see how that affects the outcome or the success rate. And if we still get that same hypothetical rate of return or your required rate of return while reducing volatility in the portfolio, what you get is an outcome that actually looks like this. So we would shave off some of the volatility or the highly volatile areas and your success rate would actually increase. Now, the second thing to take from a Monte Carlo analysis is if we're going through retirement here and you were along this line and we start to deviate from this path somewhere along the line, we're not just gonna run out of money by age 86. Part of working with a financial planner is updating your plan and updating your, your portfolio to get you back on track here. So things that you can do with your financial planner are rebalancing on a consistent basis. You might wanna take money from different asset classes in different market conditions to return to that line there to ensure that you reach your financial goals. So I know that Monte Carlo can be a tough concept to wrap your head around. I know the first time I heard it, I didn't quite understand how I could have the exact same average rate of return as somebody else, 
but have a different outcome than them and a different amount of money at the end of the day. So I'm the type of guy that needs to prove it to himself. And I actually created a big Excel spreadsheet um, and I took the actual rates of return from the TSX over a 25 year period. And then I ran that through a retirement scenario and then I ran it in reverse. And you actually get drastically different outcomes when you do those two exercises. So it's something that's really important for specifically retirees or those people who are withdrawing on their capital to live off of because volatility can have a, a large impact on your successful retirement uh, compared to those who are putting money into their portfolio. Uh, and that's scenarios where volatility can actually work to your advantage. Uh, you can buy on the lows, you can uh, put money in on a dollar cost averaging basis. Um, but really the management of a portfolio should change when you re reach that retirement age. Um, so with that being said, I said at the beginning, I'd be talking about portfolio management as well as um, uh, financial planning and really how those two merge. So to talk about the financial planning, I'm not going to get into too much detail on all the specific numbers here um, because that's not really the point. This scenario might resonate with some, it might not resonate with others, but really the point of looking at this is to say when it comes to financial planning, uh, a good financial planner should be able to show you a tangible difference that their advice makes to you. So to your situation and, and really how that affects on the long run. Um, and the way we do that is by creating a financial plan, a written financial plan, and really showing in numbers with our planning software how that makes a difference. And that's important for us as financial planners to see that all of our strategies make a difference and as well for clients to see that that a financial planner is actually uh, creating value for you. So in our case study here, we have Nicole and Sam, they're approaching retirement. Uh, they have a number of different assets in different accounts. They have GICs, RSPs, TFSAs, um, and you can see in here we've captured standard deviation for all of their different investments. So I mentioned before for a Monte Carlo analysis, that's very important for us to judge the volatility of their portfolio. Now, currently what they're doing or what they're planning is, is they want to withdraw on those RSPs early, spread out the tax bill. This is what we hear from people quite often. Um, they also want to transfer the chalet to their son, Al, um, and pay the capital gains on that. And they have a GIC earmarked for that event. Um, now, some family planning that's coming uh, come into this scenario is Al doesn't have any savings, um, and he's engaged to somebody that they barely know. Um, and then the final thing is they want to use their TFSAs for annual shortfalls and big lump sum costs. So they're using their TFSA more as an emergency fund rather than a retirement vehicle. Now, the first place we start is through cash flow. So we want to know what are they spending? What are their fixed expenses that they need to cover in retirement? And what are their discretionary expenses that they plan on covering? So that would be their financial goals. What do, what do they really want to do with their retirement and how much do they need? Um, and then we see where are the incomes coming from? So they have some pension income, CPP, OAS, GIC, some guaranteed types of income, and then there'll be a gap there. So between what they want to spend and what they're fixed incomes are, what do those investments need to cover? And that's really how do we come up with that sustainable withdrawal rate? Now they sit down with a financial planner here and come up with five strategies uh, to improve their financial situation and create that full retirement plan. Uh, the first one being splitting their pension income. Now this is a, a basic um, retirement planning tool that a lot of people use and it's a great way to instead of having all of the pension income taxed under one person's name and bump them into a higher tax bracket we split it between the two spouses and we can actually reduce taxes that way uh, the second one is redeeming rsps later instead of earlier so really what we're talking about is the retirement income order um, and we'll see really in the numbers how that affects their overall financial plan um, the third being purchase a small annuity instead of a GIC. So if we compare those rates of return, both guaranteed income and annuity can have some more tax advantages. Um, and then it comes to the TFSA. So really rebalancing the TFSA and seeing how that looks in a Monte Carlo analysis uh, to get a good average rate of return while reducing the volatility um, and then continuing to save money into that TFSA throughout retirement. So a lot of people stop putting money into their TFSA at retirement. We want to keep funding that TFSA and that might just mean moving it from different asset classes into the TFSA uh, to max that out every year. 
And then we're actually going to use the TFSA as a retirement vehicle. So we're not going to use it every single year uh, to pull money out or for emergencies. We're going to defer it as long as possible to get the maximum amount of tax free growth and then start, start withdrawing on that, that account there. Um, and then for the family planning, deferring the transfer of the chalet um, and deferring the capital gain. So instead of having a big lump sum capital gain that we have to pay right away, we're going to pay that capital gain down the road. So the way we judge this, uh, one of the ways we can do it is look at lifetime spending and to see if there's any shortfalls or deficits in the financial plan. And really what this chart is showing us here is every single year, how much money do we need in retirement? And then where are those sources of capital coming from? And you can see at the end of their retirement, they actually have a shortfall um, and it equates to around $500,000. Uh, so a number of things would have to happen. Either we would have to redo the retirement plan um, and they would have to live off less in retirement. They could push retirement back or we could do some financial planning to see if we can uh, reach all of their goals. Now, we would compare this side by side with all of our recommendations. And in this example, all we're including here is splitting the pension income. And you can see that it actually increases their lifetime spending by $100,000 and decreases that shortfall at the end. Now that's just one example and one way to compare the financial planning. A different way to do that is to use the Monte Carlo analysis like I was demonstrating earlier. And this is really tying the financial planning and the portfolio construction together to see that success rate at the bottom here. So without any financial planning, as of right now, if they did nothing, they would have a 66% chance of reaching all of their financial goals in many different market conditions. So in some of the worst market conditions and in some of the best, they came out with a 66% chance. Now, when we start introducing these strategies, we can see how that affects that success rate. So like we talked about earlier, splitting that pension income actually increases it to 67%. And there's that $100,000 of uh, net lifetime spending. Um, now I'll back up a bit here and talk about these three metrics. Um, we have net lifetime spending, lifetime tax, and net estate. And these are really three good metrics for us as financial planners to look at to see how our strategies and the things that we put in place, how they affect your financial plan. Uh, because Sometimes people just look at net estate, it might be quite larger because of all the strategies we put into place and they say, I don't really want to hand down more to the next generation. Well, then we can do net lifetime spending. You can actually spend more of your money in retirement. So those are two different contrasting ways to look at it. And then everybody wants to decrease the amount of tax they pay so we can look at that metric as well. So the second piece that we put in is change the order of redemption. And you can see that really affected that success rate a lot. So we jumped from 67 all the way to 83%. And it affected net estate, lifetime tax, and lifetime spending in that order. Now, the third one is buying an annuity, and that bumps it up to 89% as well. Uh, we save more tax buying the annuity rather than using that GIC. The other one was optimizing the TFSA, and that bumps us up to 92%. So really using the TFSA and being effective with that TFSA makes a large difference down the road. And then the final one being defer the cottage capital gain payment. So the longer we can defer that capital gain, rather than paying the tax today, we want to defer that as long as possible. That gets us up to 95% success rate. And that's really the takeaway here is to see, we started at 66% with no planning. That was our likelihood of success through retirement. And through all the financial planning, using the software, we were able to show that we increased that to 95%. Uh, so we increased lifetime spending by over $500,000, decreased lifetime tax by $124,000, or increased their estate by a $1,000,000. Uh, so really significant um, way to show that the advisor in this scenario is adding a lot of uh, value through that financial planning. So with that, I will hand things over to Jamie Buchan. Um, and really what he's going to be talking about is what should you be looking for in a financial planner? Uh, he has a lot of a lot of experience working with a number of different financial planners, not just at IG Wealth Management, but a number of different institutions. Um, and he's really going to say, what should you look for in an, in an advisor? And then why he works with the Daimler team um, moving forward. So I will hand things over to Jamie and he will take you through this. Thank you so much, uh, Lucas. Uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, and really, you know, after all of that, what you and Rob both did, you'd actually ask yourself, you know, where do I go from here? If you're already an existing client, 
um, what gives people peace of mind is actually seeing this is what these guys do and their team does in behind the scenes. And so for most people, they're going to ask, well, how does this how does this work for me? You know, um, like, how does that picture be represented in my particular situation or with my planner? If you're actually not working with this particular team or one of the teams that I coach, I actually will not coach a team that doesn't do holistic um, interconnected financial planning and uh, this is kind of what this means to me when we go over this particular little you know quick like test to see what you're getting and one of the reasons i do work with the Dahmer team and the, the only teams i do work with is i want to make sure they're doing proper financial planning for their clients so there's a there's a clear distinction between someone who's just an investment advisor an insurance agent, a stockbroker, whatever it might be, if if you're not getting all of these um, and they don't score between 14 and 16, and I would add three or four onto there, and when I go over these, I'll show you what I mean by that. But really, this is what a financial planner is. I think Rob was saying about someone who thinks they could predict the market and accurately, like. It, Nobody's really been able to do it. I mean, Warren Buffett one year um, had a negative portfolio of somewhere around thirty uh, billion dollars in his ups and downs and his with his net worth. So, um, don't think that they get it right all the time either. They just write and they stay in the market more often. So, if the person doesn't, you don't score at least fourteen yes. to sixteen in here. This says run uh, to find a new advisor at six or less. If it was if it was 13 or less, I would say what you have is not a financial planner. So first of all, in the first category, about um, to hear from your financial planner uh, once a year uh, minimum for sure. If it was only once a year, I would not score that as a point. That is not a financial advisor from my perspective. You need to be in constant contact via the phone, face to face, whatever it might be. That person has got their finger on the pulse of the markets, your tax situation, estate situation, making sure your wills, personal directives, power of attorney are current and updated. That is a constant, it is a moving target. And so that is critical uh, of what a financial planner uh, planning team does. That's what the Dahlner team does. So one again, uh, you know, check mark them for them. Um, I get response within 24 hours, emails. I would say that's probably more true than not with most people. It's going to be in a timely manner no matter what. But you would expect a timely response. Again, check mark in their particular situation. When we talk about guaranteed retirement income options beyond CPP and OS, OAS, those are just small components. Um, you probably saw in in uh, looking at Lu Lucas's presentation, there's all these different things, you know, TFSA, a GIC, your RSP, your riffing, like an acronym for just about anything. How does that all bind together? And uh, what Lucas showed you was an excellent demonstration of what an actual real financial planner should be doing is looking at all those components to maximize your rates of return. Once again, a check mark in their situation. Remembering, I don't work with just the Dahmer team. I work with many, many teams. So it's easy for me to be an advocate of them. I referred them over 20 clients myself. And the reason I have is because I feel very confident that you would get exceptional service with this particular team. All right. Um, my advisor asked me questions about my life goals and aspirations. Well, it goes well beyond that. They should be asking you questions not only about that, but your families your kids, intergenerational inter financial planning, succession planning, all of that. That is a big, big question. Goals, aspirations, those are definitely a part of it. But at the end of the day, in that, it's giving you peace of mind. And once again, check mark with the Daimler team. I have a copy of my written financial plan, and it is updated often. And it really has to be. Uh, I mean, some of these financial plans can be 80 to 100 pages long. Well, you probably wouldn't get that because it doesn't make sense. Because the second you walk out of their office, 
the plan has already started to change. The markets are changing. Tax situation changes. There's a COVID. There's a change of government. So it is a moving target, you know, hence why you'd want to stay in contact with your advisor more than once a year and uh, at least talking to them two, three times a year. And that's once your financial plan is well uh, situated and grounded and, the, and the, really the foundation is set. If you're in a relationship, both partners' views have been addressed. Yeah, financial planning isn't about one partner like ever. It's always about both. And so, you know, some people indicate that, you know, my husband, my wife, um, they take care of all this. Well, what if your husband or wife isn't around? It's critical that both people are a part of that. So if you listen to that whole presentation before, you know, what I'm saying, and you go, oh, this stuff doesn't make sense to me. I mean, this is uh, like voodoo math or whatever it is. Well, that's, that's fine. What you need to know, that's what's happening in behind the scenes. I had one of my uh, referrals to the Dahmer team came. We went to their uh, presentation. It was very similar to what we just saw. And uh, I was sitting in the audience with him, and he turns to look at me. He goes, he goes, I don't know exactly what he's talking about, but he sure, he sure seems to know what he's talking about. And he had an incredible amount of confidence in him. I have incredible amount of confidence but in both him and Lucas. And, uh, uh, you know, he transferred all his assets over to Rob and his team um, and didn't, there, there's no way he could know everything that they ever, they knew, but he trusted them. And what he has now is peace of mind. My advisor tries to help me improve my financial habits. Well, sometimes planners, at least when I was a planner, I know with this team, Sometimes they have to be behavior modificationists. Sometimes people come to them, unfortunately, when they're already in trouble rather than being proactive. That seems to be the reality of the situation. So we have to uh, work on ways to develop uh, different investment and savings uh, behaviors. My advisor covers matters beyond investments like debt, taxes, insurance. Well, a grant, a great financial planning team, they're working hand in hand with tax specialists, lawyers, you know, uh, investors group happens to have a great head office with unbelievable resources. I know I introduced a lawyer to the Daimler team that they've done several wills, personal objectives, endowing, and during power of attorney that we've worked with those people hand in hand. And now they have that stuff put in place and not just put in place, but put in place correctly. Um, again, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but I've seen wills that aren't written properly. They're going to cause more problems than even if you didn't have a will and you died in test state. So that is a critical component of a financial planner. Once again, check mark there for the Daimler team. I have a clear understanding what I have in my portfolio and why. Once again, it can become extremely complicated, but what I like about what this team attempts to do, which they do the best they can at, is simplify what you have. Tax advantages, tax um, uh, investments that get uh, preferential tax treatment, things like that. Things that are very, for the most part, very conservative, even if they do fluctuate in value. I've maximized all income splitting and tax deferral opportunities. There are almost so many you can't uh, name and and the only ones that you get introduced to that may or may not be applicable to you but again similar to what Lucas showed this you know here are a few strategies that if we put in place would reduce the amount of tax increase the net worth and so on my advisor has clearly explained the cost of ownership of my investments well there's things called MERs management expense ratios what does it actually cost to get all this vice and save all this money tax-wise and give you peace of mind. Um, I think that it, it's, it's important to know that people do get paid for that. Investment advisors get paid, the institution gets paid. That's whether you have your money at the, the Royal Bank or co-op, wherever it is. Um, there is a cost to doing business. What we, what I teach and what they demonstrate is, um, do you feel you get value for what you pay? And that's the bottom line. And if that comes in the form of an intangible, which uh, Lucas talked about tangibles and intangible, intangible and tangible, like you could say, 
hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes, but you know, what is the value of having peace of mind knowing people are taking care of your financial plan? My advisor is a certified financial planner. Um, and I would go, that just makes sense, right? That's what they're training their background is, right? If it's not that designation, it should be something at least as equal to that. But that is the industry standard, and that's what you need to make sure you look for. Once again, a check mark there. My advisor understands my tolerance for losing money because we have talked about it. Uh, I mean, personally, I don't really like the way that's worked because in all my experience with the Dommler team, and I've known Rob for 27 years plus, and with my experience in the industry, which was over 30 years altogether, working with teams and stuff, very seldom is there a loss is even on the table with the type of investments they do. It might, you might choose a capital loss, but really losing money is generally not an option. I know in the years that I've worked with Rob and on my own, uh, never had anyone lose money unless they decided to sell at an inopportune time. So, uh, but that question maybe should be better worried. I understand that my portfolio may go down in value at any given protect any uh, period of time. And, and I have to learn to be comfortable with that if I want to uh, benefit from the long-term growth. I have a current will and power of attorney. Uh, I would also include in Alberta, we have the personal directives is for health. Is it, all that stuff is so critical. Uh, in fact, you could do a lot of this other stuff, right? And you've dropped the ball on these. Um, you could be in some trouble, you know, especially if you're dealing with elderly parents who have dementia or, or Al Alzheimer's, or you have to, um, you know, make sure you care at a different level. And it's same with your kids and going into you. So that stuff should be taken care of very early in life, right? Making sure you pick the right kind of guardians for your kids, right? If you are guardians, what you're, um, you know, what you need to do, even if you're an executor. You know, there's 37 things on a checklist that you were responsible for. So do you want to take that on? And uh, vice versa, if you give somebody an executorship. So that there's only a few words in that box, but the extent is massive. I mean, that is so critical. And uh, once again, uh, that's what I like about Rob, the team check mark, making sure that those are done right for, for their clients. Um, and again, I got like tons of stories and I may share one when I'm done with this. My advisor is a simplifier. I come out of the interactions with greater clarity. And you know, what is like clarity? You know, I don't understand exactly what an MER is and how it works and, and uh, you know, how uh, the stock market works, the intricacies of it. You know, maybe not, but you know, understanding the simplification of you know, money goes up and down. Here's how it works generally. You're well diversified. Again, just a way to help give you peace of mind that the kind of portfolio you have and the kind of plan that you have put together is going to give you and your family peace of mind. I am confident my savings will last through retirement, even with mar market volatility. And again, that was a really good example of what Lucas did early in showing the plan of, uh, you know, Monte Carlo and all those different type tools that are able to be used. So again, in, in, in the Dahmer and uh, the Dahmer and, uh, you know, with Lucas working hand in hand with him and the team, uh, I would give this team 16 out of 16. And yet I'd add a few categories on it. I'd give them like 20 out of 20. So um, I can't be totally objective um, because I've actually decided to move my family's uh, financial planning to the Dahmer team, and I could have chose just about anyone I wanted. So that's how confident I feel in this team, and that's why I feel like I'm a, a huge advocate. And I've referred over 20 people to this team, and uh, I will continue to refer people because they uh, have a check marks in each one of those boxes. So, um, and situations that I was able to introduce, like including my own with my father, who's got the man shoes, bit of a runner, trying to find a safe haven for him. Also, you know, I have a story with my grandmother and her sister. They didn't have the wills. You know, here's one, one of the reasons I, I'm so, I don't know, if anal's the right word about that, making sure that that stuff is properly done. You know, the wills were done for my great-grandmother. 
and my grandmother and her sister, um, my great grandmother lived with my grandmother and she took care of her for 10, 15 years, fed her, made sure her medication was there, lived in the same house. And when she passed away, she left my grandmother her home. And uh, seemed like a reasonable thing to do. But my grandmother's sister was not very happy, felt that the home should be split in value and she should have got half. And there might be an argument for that. But at the end of the day, they never talked again ever after that point because there was no family communication. There was no sharing of the will, sharing the information. Even though everything was done the way someone was thought, there was a relationship that was torn apart, that never got put back together. And with proper financial planning and proper communication and succession planning, that would have never happened. So this is one thing that we would never want to see anybody who's a member of the Dahmer uh, family of, of clients ever see happen to them. Once again, I got a dozen stories um, similar, but that one really hit home. That's one of the reasons, you know, I spent a lot of time explaining why that is so critical. Right? Anywho, um, that's all I have to say about that. But, you know, if in your mind you went through this and, you know, your experience with the drama team or with the financial planner is, you know, 16 out of 16 or out of 20, <laughs> um, you've got yourself a good financial planner. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks, Lucas. Um, I really appreciate all the uh, things being said there. Uh, it's so important. You know, there's many of my clients, we have multi-generational planning going on. So when you're doing your financial planning with your advisor, they need to know about your kids, your grandparents. There's just so many things that happen there. Um, and, you know, we've covered a lot of things today. Lucas went through a sample financial plan and it may be very very different than your situation but the that's the uh the reality of this is that if you're doing your own retirement planning you do it once you get one crack at it you can't make any mistakes uh, the advantage of working with a professional advisor is that we do it uh you know many many times for many different uh, families and generations that's really why i love what i do because it's incredible the conversations i have with my my clients uh, that aren't just about again investments uh because investments are something that we have very difficult time controlling the outcome uh, but we do have control of making sure everybody's looked after making sure our clients have full understanding and peace of mind on their retirement plan so we will uh, just want to thank everybody for coming here uh, by all means share this video with anybody else that you uh, know um, you can easily reach out to us anytime if you would like to go through this process explore your current situation and build a financial plan uh, like Jamie talked about, we need to monitor and adjust that plan as time goes on. It's not a one-time event. It needs to be going on on a regular basis. And so again, I'd like to thank everybody for your time. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, here's our email addresses and our phone number. Uh, obviously, a lot of us are working from home today. But again, thank everybody for your time. And please don't hesitate to ask us any questions via email uh, if you would like to get more information. Thank you very much.